Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Doctors for America's August 2023 Advocacy Grand Rounds. Uh, our session today is titled The Implications of Accelerated Approval for Gene Therapies. My name is Josh Skydell. I'm a resident in internal medicine and a member of Doctors for America's FDA task force. Before we get started, I would like to take a quick minute to invite you to officially join Doctors for America, or DFA. Becoming a paid member today means supporting DFA's organizational sustainability as well as our advocacy work. A DFA team member will put the link to join in the chat if you're interested. We will be live streaming this session on Facebook Live, and we will make both the recording and all materials available afterwards. I have a few brief notes and requests for this session. Uh, first, please be respectful. We're all here to learn and to connect. Feel free to ask questions using the Q&A feature. Uh, and we will address questions in the second half of our session. Look out for comments in the chat as DFA staff will be sharing helpful links during the session. And of course, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We have a great panel of speakers today. First, we have Dr. Diana Zuckerman, who is the president of the National Center for Health Research, a nonprofit think tank that conducts and analyzes research on a wide range of healthcare and health policy issues and uses those results to inform policies and programs affecting the health of adults and children. She has testified about the safety and efficacy of medical and consumer products before Congress, federal agencies, state legislative committees, and the Canadian Parliament. And joining us shortly uh, as our second speaker will be Dr. Michael Abrams, who is a senior researcher in Public Citizens Health Research Group. Michael's research uh, focuses on behavioral health, drug and device safety and efficacy, occupational safety and health, and broader health policy issues. He has over 25 years of clinical and governance research experience in the health sciences. And his research has focused on brain-based illness, including psych psychiatric diseases, such as schizophrenia and depression, addictions, such as opioid and alcohol use disorders, and degenerative and neurodevelopmental diseases, such as dementia and autism. So with that, uh, I would welcome Dr. Diana Zuckerman um, to give her presentation. Uh, again, feel free to leave questions in the chat along the way that we'll discuss later. And after that, we'll hear from Dr. Abrams. Uh, okay, that's great. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, let's put up my slides. I'm Dr. Diana Zuckerman. I'm president of the National Center for Health Research. We're a public health think tank that focuses on the safety and effectiveness of medical products. Um, my training is in epidemiology and public health, um, and our center has uh, scientists, physicians, uh, and other health professionals um, and so everything that we do is evidence-based. Uh, and we do not accept funding from pharmaceutical companies or medical device companies or companies that make any of the products that we evaluate. Um, and I forgot my disclosure slide, so that will do. Next slide, please. So there's a re been a recent trend at the FDA um, to fast track therapeutics of all types. And there are many different kinds of fast tracking. We will be focusing on accelerated approval today, but I just wanted to emphasize that it's not the only way that uh, drugs and biologics are getting on the market more quickly than ever before. And the benefits of speeding things up is that it costs less money to study uh, these products and they do get to the market more quickly. Um, the clear uh, uh, risk is uh, that insurance companies don't always pay if the products aren't proven to actually work. And Medicare and Medicaid, of course, get jeopardized um, because they have to pay for things that not only may not work, but may actually do harm and end up costing a lot more money. Uh, obviously, the big issue, though, is the risk to patients and physicians as products get on the market more quickly before they've been proven to work and before there's any information about long-term safety. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna show a couple of slides. This is from a study that we did um, a few years ago um, where we were looking at cancer drugs that another researcher uh, had found had not ever been proven to work. Uh, these were all different kinds of cancer drugs 
And we did a follow up five years later to see if there was now, you know, five years later, if there was evidence that they worked. And you can see that the prices range greatly. Uh, and of course, prices are a lot higher now, but then it was, the prices were just over $20,000 per patient to um, over, almost $180,000 per patient and there's no relationship between how much they cost and what the evidence was. Uh, in fact, at the uh, to the right, you see that the one with that did have proven better quality of life um, cost basically the same as the one that had worse quality of life. And that was the only difference. There was no difference in terms of overall survival. And here's a slide from 2016. I only throw this in because you can see that the prices then, which were already quite high um, for the most expensive US prescription drugs, um, aren't anything like the prices we're gonna be talking about today. So first I'm gonna talk about um, Sarepta's uh, first drug that was approved for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this is a rare disease. You'll hear much more about it from Michael. Um, what was found was that for this first drug that was approved in 2016, it had been studied um, uh, for a very short period of time. And in fact, after less than six months, the company Sarepta had eliminated the placebo controls. Um, even though the drug was intended for lifelong use, it is not a cure, it was intended to be, to help delay uh, the terrible uh, deterioration that happens from Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, they eliminated the placebo controls because they said their preliminary data seemed to show it might work and they thought it would be unethical. Uh, but the other reason they did it was because they had so few patients, uh, they did end up with only 12 patients and no control group. So when they eliminated the placebo controls, it became an open label study, which means of course that everybody knew that they were getting the drug and that can influence uh, re results, especially when they were looking at whether the boys could do a better job of walking. They were supposed to compare the, the boys taking the drug to the boys uh, who were in placebo, but there was no comparison group except a historical control. And the trouble with a historical control is when you have boys who have this kind of um, condition where it can be painful and difficult to walk, if they're not in a study, they have no incentive to walk more. So they ended up in some cases, boys were mislabeled as not being able to walk when they could have walked, but they just had no incentive to do so um, in, in a historical control. And two of the boys did very poorly on the drug. In fact, they, they lost the ability to walk, but the company, Sarepta, decided that that early loss of their ability to walk was unrelated to treatment. How did they decide that? Uh, they just decided it. There was no evidence one way or the other. So any one of these problems with the study, let me say in all the years I've been working uh, with the FDA and going to FDA advisory committee meetings and reading the data and looking at the evidence for approval. I've never seen, never seen a drug approved on the basis of 12 patients with no control group. But any one of these issues would have normally been enough to uh, decide not to approve this drug. Um, but despite this, the FDA approved it. So the U US law requires evidence of safety and effectiveness and the burden of proof lies with the company, not with FDA to prove that it doesn't work. But still, if this drug actually did work, uh, then Sarepta really failed itself and patients and doctors and families by ignoring FDA's repeated advice that they needed a control group and they needed a larger sample. But what was particularly interesting was in the last couple of years, just before Sarepta got approval, they had been enrolling patients into a larger study uh, that was intended to be more than 100 boys. Um, remember, this is a rare disease, so it, it was a little harder to get um, patients enrolled. But despite the fact that the 
the ad advisory committee met in 2016, they were not shown any data from this other study that, you know, did have many more patients in it, many more boys in it than the 12 that were in the data presented. Uh, at this public meeting, oops, no, go back, please. At this advisory committee meeting, many patients and family members testified in support of approval. And in fact, we had talked to um, some of the parents of the boys in the study who told us that they were told by the company that the company would basically go out of business if FDA didn't approve it within the next month. They said, you know, it's not good enough if FDA says we won't make a decision until we have more data because we don't have, you know, we, the company, make only this one product and we won't have the money to um, continue our studies. And in fact, uh, the director of FDA's Center for Drugs, Dr. Janet Woodcock, who's a deputy commissioner currently, um, uh, was on the record as saying that that was the reason why she felt that the drug had to be approved. All of the scientists and statisticians at the FDA who had anything to do with reviewing this drug said, absolutely, we should not approve it. She overruled them. And that really set a very dangerously low bar for all drugs in the future, including uh, later on drugs for Duchenne's. Uh, we recently uh, published a study with Aaron Kesselheim and uh, Liam Bendrickson from Harvard. And this was just published a couple of days ago, actually. And this table comes from that um, paper where we compared all the Duchenne muscular dystrophy drugs that have received accelerated approval. And by the way, those are all the drugs there are. There aren't any that didn't get accelerated approval. And you can see the names of them. There are uh, five drugs, four of them all made by Sarepta, one made by NS Pharma. And they are for different types of Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy, but a similar situation. You can see the first one got approved in September of 2016, the most recent one in just June of this year. And um, all of these drugs were got accelerated approval. They all have to do studies to confirm that they actually work. And the um, first drug approved in 2016 was supposed to submit that data in 2020, which would have seemed reasonable since they were already collecting more data at the time that the drug was approved. But that study was never completed and they never uh, did submit anything in 2020, except they started a new study in 2020 that we hope will get results next year. And this is how much these products cost. Um, there's some variation, and I, but for the first four Sarepta drugs, they're all go up to about a million dollars a year that the boys are supposed to take for the rest of their lives. And um, it does depend on dosage. It depends on their weight. And so that's why it's a little hard to say um, exactly how much it is, but they're all around a million a year they go i should say they all go up to about a million a year depending on how much the boys weigh um, the last drug which is the one that um, dr abrams will talk about next um, is actually 3.2 million dollars per patient what's different about that drug about that uh, gene therapy drug is that uh, it's supposed to be a one-time only product uh, the, the problem is that it's not actually proven to work. And once the patient gets that particular product, they will not be eligible for any other kind of similar treatments in the future, um, which Michael will explain. So why were they all approved? Can we do these one at a time? First of all, at this public meeting, patients and their parents begged for approval. In fact, the um, center director, uh, Dr. Woodcock, was there, was taking selfies with the boys, um, and was pressured 
personally by them to approve the drug and apparently uh, actually I heard uh, did tell them that uh, don't worry she'll take care of them next slide I'm uh, sorry not next slide next point um, and as I said she uh, justified her decision saying that the company needed FDA approval in order to be able to afford uh, to continue its research. Next uh, point. FDA was willing to ignore their own scientists, hoping that the drugs would do no harm and would eventually be proven to work. Next point. But that first approval of that first drug, 12 patients, no control group, has set a precedent for all of the other drugs that got accelerated approval for Duchenne muscular dystrophy because FDA does like to be consistent. But not only did it set the stage for them to be approved based on uh, very limited information, but for many other drugs, for many other kinds of um, conditions as well. So does accelerated approval help patients? That's the, what is supposed to be the goal. Well, keep in mind that as long as the kids were taking these as experimental drugs in a clinical trial, the drugs were free. As soon as it got accelerated approval, the company can charge whatever they wanted. It was the only product available and they charged, um, they initially charged about $300,000 for the first drug, but that, that um, increased over time, partly because the boys weighed more than was expected and needed a higher dose. It's therefore not surprising when you see how much these drugs cost that most Sarepta drugs for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and that's all that they make, um, most of them are paid by Medicaid. And what seems to be happening is that the families start out paying for the drugs quickly run out of money and then become eligible for Medicaid. And so Medicaid is paying for these drugs, even though we don't know if they work or not. And what is really disturbing is that it becomes impossible to do a post-market randomized control trial once these products are approved. First of all, because patients don't want themselves or their children to potentially be assigned to placebo. Um, and also because once patients are in a post-market study, they're just going to drop out if they don't seem to be benefiting, and then they will you know, find some way to be eligible uh, to pay for the drug since it's already approved. I think we're at my, my last, oh, I'm sorry, and that we all, pay, thank you, and we all pay for these drugs. It's not just, I mean, this is a rare disease, but when you have anything that costs a million dollars per patient per year, um, you know, we are paying by, as taxpayers paying for Medicaid, and we're paying because insurance company premium, premiums go up when they pay for these um, drugs. And, and some of the insurance companies did refuse to pay initially when um, the first uh, Duchenne drugs were um, approved. They said this is experimental. We don't care if FDA approved it or not. It's still experimental and we're not going to pay. But over time, they just got uh, pressured into paying for them. And I think that's one more slide, just my final slide. Um, if you have questions, um, <clears throat> you can learn more about these drugs on our website, www.centerforresearch.org, or feel free to contact me. And of course, you'll have been able to answer, ask, <clears throat> excuse me, any questions today. Um, but my email is dz at centerforresearch.org. And I have one other thing I wanted to show you. I actually just got this yesterday from change.org. So if you can show this last thing, one pager. I wanted to share this uh, from change.org. This is a short version of it. I hope you can see the whole thing. Maybe, yeah, move it up. Um, so I, do get these from change.org, but yeah, that's better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> try to move it so no, so you can see more of it. If there's only one page. There's only one page of it. Um, so basically, this is a parent begging us to uh, sign a petition so that his son, Cash, can get 
this drug, this new Duchenne's drug that Michael will be focusing on. Um, what's really disturbing about this, a couple of things. I, I underlined one thing. Their insurance company is refusing to pay, saying that this new drug is experimental. And then they say, but if that were the case, why would FDA approve it? And also, why would some states' Blue Cross Blue Shield plans agree to cover it? But what's also disturbing is that they're very upset that their child is too old and that the drug is only approved for four and five-year-olds and their son uh, just turned six. And they're saying, but we should he should still be eligible because we applied when he was only five. And they don't understand that the reason why um, FDA only approved it for four and five year olds is because it absolutely did not work for anybody older. It did not work for six or seven year olds. And in fact, there's a hope that there will be some other new treatment that will come along that might possibly work. Um, it, it's, it won't be this one. And if he did get this drug, he would not be eligible to get the, the, um, the other drug that might possibly actually work. So in this case, I mean, this is just kind of typical. They're blaming the insurance company, which of course looks like the bad guy for refusing to number one, uh, pay for a drug that really isn't proven to work and costs several million dollars, but also not understanding that sometimes, you know, the, there is a reason, there's a very good scientific reason why only certain age groups are eligible. It's not because they're being mean, it's because they're proven to not work. Whereas they're not proven to work for, um, for four and five-year-olds, they are definitely proven to not work for six and seven-year-olds. Um, so I will leave that with you and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zuckerman, especially for being, bringing both a scientific and a patient's perspective um, into this conversation. Um, next, we will hear from Dr. Abrams. Um, again, um, we'll hold questions until the um, final portion of our session, but as they come up, feel free to place them in the chat. Um, so with that said, um, I welcome Dr. Abrams. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, Josh. Yes, yes. Good. Uh, forgive me, I'm on a uh, cell phone. I had a little trouble with Zoom here. So first I want to uh, to thank um, Dr. Zuckerman for pivoting nicely and going first. I was actually supposed to go first. Um, and um, uh, I think my slides are coming up. That's great. If you can put them in the display mode for me, that'd be excellent. So I'm Michael Abrams from um, Public Citizens Health Research Group. The topic today is, of course, uh, accelerated approval. And I put that in quotation marks because this is a fast track authority uh, that the FDA uses. And we think too much. We're like minded with Dr. Zuckerman on that. She, she uh, described some of that uh, well. So that's a key part of uh, the points that I will be making uh, this afternoon. Um, gene therapy is also a, a key uh, topic here. And then we're using this Duchenne's muscular dystrophy treatment in four to five-year-olds, all right, very young kids, uh, as the example. Um, and uh, noting at the bottom of my slide, oftentimes it's what people do not note when they testify or when they, uh, when they present in this sort of forum is that I have no financial conflicts of interest, but we do know that the um, financial stakes are exceedingly high here, as are the clinical stakes, uh, uh, noting that Dr. Zuckerman pointed out the treatment we're talking about currently is priced at $3.2 million for uh, one-time treatment. So what I'm going to do is to quickly uh, go over uh, uh, the disease that we're talking about and also briefly review gene therapy um, um, for you all as well. You know, we're talking about a brutal disease here, uh, uh, Duchenne's phenotype and genotype, an X-linked uh, a disease so and recessive disease so principally affects males, but some females also can be impacted. Um, catastrophic muscle weakness, and that maybe is an understatement. We're talking about uh, muscle weakness that not only affects skeletal muscle, but also um, uh, leads to cardiomyopathy, diaphragm challenges, and breathing challenges as well. Um, the full uh, Duchenne is principally the target of the, of the intervention that we're talking about. But there are 
more intermediate forms of the disease, which are relevant in this case to the type of treatment that was chosen. So there's a, a, a far more mild Becker phenotype. I'm going to uh, uh, detail that a bit for you in the future. And then there are intermediate forms. It's somewhat um, uh, or exceedingly heterogeneous with regard to uh, the genetic mutation that underlies this, uh, which uh, affects the dystrophin protein expression. Um, the incidence is uh, one in 3,500 to 5,500 male births, or just under one per 10,000 five to 23 year olds. Considered a rare disorder, which is one of the reasons um, that the, uh, that the folks are somewhat desperate uh, if you're impacted by this, and why it's difficult to get uh, 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 drugs to market because we're not talking about high volumes. It's it's certainly one of the reasons why the treatment. Uh, treatments that become available are so expensive is because there are not a lot of consumers um, uh, uh, that uh, will benefit directly from it. Um, the bottom two bullets, just a reminder about how brutal this disease is. Uh, usually the symptoms don't start manifesting until about age two to three years. With your wheelchair bound by age 12 to 13. By age 14, 33% have cardiomyopathy. By age 18, almost everybody. Uh, has that uh, uh, symptomology with the full Duchenne phenotype. Uh, and of course, uh, terrible disease, early 20s, death is often the consequence. So as I said, there are uh, at least two forms of, of muscular dystrophy and the Becker versus Duchenne um, dichotomy is an important one here. With full Duchenne, we're talking about the protein uh, dystrophin being completely compromised in terms of its expression. With Becker, however, it's much more intermediate. And these uh, uh, kids who have the Becker genotype or phenotype um, are ambulatory for longer. Um, they, have, uh, they still have cardiomyopathy concerns and so forth, but they live longer as well. Um, and the, uh, with Duchenne's, we're talking about dystrophin expression being um, you know, almost uh, entirely compromised. But with Becker, it's one of two things. Either there's less of the dystrophin molecule being expressed, or and this is very important in terms of the drug that we're talking about, or the biologic, I should say, because it's a very complicated, large molecule. Uh, with the Becker uh, genotype and phenotype, we're talking about a smaller dystrophin molecule being evident um, in uh, individuals who have that form of, of muscular dystrophy. Next slide, please. So let's talk briefly about gene therapy now, because uh, that's an important reason why, for example, public citizen, typically we focus on diseases that are far more prevalent when we uh, choose to testify in this kind of format. But in this case, we thought it was important for us to enter the fray here because um, gene therapies are, are of wide importance to disease. And I don't think, I think for this uh, audience, it's quite, uh, it's quite evident uh, quite evident to you all, you're mostly clinicians by my understanding. Um, but gene therapy, you know, many possibilities and many methods, and there are ethical concerns as well. I won't be discussing those, but the purpose of gene therapy is to deliver a transgene, right? To deliver uh, some genetic material uh, to, uh, uh, to ameliorate disease in some form. And just a reminder quickly in four bullets here about what we're talking about. And I've underlined the, the attributes that pertain specifically to this Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy treatment that we're talking about. Um, the, in this case, it's, uh, we're talking about autologous uh, uh, delivery of a transgene. So um, it's, there's no donor cells involved. What we're talking about is delivering the genetic material to the muscle cells of uh, the individual who's uh, impacted. And then those cells use the genetic material to express protein. Gene therapy typically is about restoring a pending genetic material that's not there. So, you know, that's what's happening in this case. But sometimes it's used as well to talk about gene editing and gene silencing, especially now with CRISPR, Cas9 uh, 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 therapies available. There's a lot of talk about editing and silencing that enters the conversation when we're talking about gene therapy. It's very important, but distinct from what we're talking about here. In this case, also for that third bullet, we're talking about a, a, a therapy that happens in vivo, right? The protein expression happens in the muscle cells, we hope, uh, of the individuals who are being treated. It's not something where you extract stem cells 
and alter the DNA and then and then reinsert them uh, after expression has occurred for uh, as a, 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 to to give you a sense of exactly what I'm talking about. The the fourth bullet there, the delivery of the genetic material is a critical component uh, of these uh, treatments and a concrete critical uh, uh, component of how this particular treatment was developed. In this case, and often viruses are used, but plasmids can also be used. Um, and you need to develop a virus that can get not not just to mitotic cells, which typically happens, say, with cancers, you know, rapidly dividing cells, but quiescent cells, in this case, muscle cells, and getting the, the genetic material there. The, the, the technical aspects are, of this are, are, uh, are, are uh, significant because we're talking about a huge protein, dystrophin, and the genetic code for dystrophin is way too big to deliver using uh, and uh, a dental associated virus, the typical packaging material that's used. And as a result, they engineered their therapy uh, specifically to be small enough uh, to deliver using an AAV. That's uh, a key component of this. Finally, uh, there are concerns with gene therapies, off target labeling, not so much an issue here because we're not talking about um, uh, gene editing, but immunogenicity for sure, you know, allergic reactions, sometimes deadly. And clinical uh, 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 efficacy are key, key concerns here with this therapy. As Dr. Zuckerman said, right now we don't know whether this particular new therapy uh, works. You know, I'll just quickly put this slide up. The potential of gene therapy is cross cutting in medicine. Uh, we've been waiting 60 years since Watson and Crick, you know, uh, found the the, the uh, structure of DNA, and, and uh, many developments have happened. And many diseases are targets of this. Duchenne's is just one, uh, one of several. Um, uh, so I won't spend much time on this slide, but let's go to the next one. So now we're talking specifically about the uh, Sarepta molecule that was developed uh, and, and recently approved by the FDA uh, or accelerated approved. Um, uh, generally speaking, it's a micro dystrophy molecule, okay, uh, or what we're talking about in terms of this biologic that approved, which falls under the moniker SRP for Sarepta-9001, that, uh, that uh, biologic essentially is genetic material wrapped in an adenovirus that is delivered, trillions of them delivered uh, by uh, infusion uh, into a patient, a young patient with Duchenne's, confirmed Duchenne's uh, muscular dystrophy. Now, what, what I'm showing you here is simply the mechanism by which it's purported that this uh, drug or this biologic will be efficacious. On the left side of the panel, you're seeing wild type dystrophin, natural type dystrophin. Note the size compared to the two molecules on the right panel. It's much bigger, probably about 75% larger than the actual molecule that Sarepta engineered, which is on the far right of this slide. Um, uh, uh, Sarepta's microdystrophin or the SRP9001 uh, molecule. They look a lot alike. I mean, this is brilliant engineering. Essentially, what you're seeing is a, is a, a sarcolemma um, uh, fiber and an, an actin fiber that's sort of uh, pistoned or, uh, or uh, uh, if you will, uh, a, has a spring-like cushion molecule that is believed to protect muscle from the degradation that leads to the muscular dystrophy uh, phenotype and death. And how did they figure out how to engineer this thing over many years? Well, they looked at the genes, uh, at the genotype and the proteins that were expressed in these, in the more mild Becker of phenotype. So, you know, uh, I don't have time to go into the details of this, but you can see sort of the elegance if you will, of the molecular structure and the engineering really is quite brilliant that went into uh, making Sarepta's uh, truncated um, uh, uh, dystrophin. That is the essence of what this therapy is about. The problem is it's a very different molecule. So we know for sure it's not going to be a complete cure. Uh, at best, it might give individuals uh, who have uh, more serious Duchenne an opportunity to live somewhat more normal or a Becker-like um, uh, uh, course of their illness. Next slide, please. So um, what I'm showing you here is the regulatory history, and Dr. Zuckerman went into this. It is troubled. 
say the least. And what we're talking about now with SRP9001 is the fourth uh, molecule that Sarepta has, has brought through accelerated approval, the fourth. Uh, Adipluricin being the most notorious from 2016, that drug showed very poor uh, uh, efficacy, and yet it was approved uh, by the FDA because of pressure from not just uh, uh, patients who are uh, uh, reasonably desperate, but also from, uh, uh, from industry as well. This is the, just the regulatory history in the FDA briefing packet of the SRP9001 molecule that was just approved. Um, and there are problems uh, here that were uh, noticed, including concerns about use of the accelerated approval pathway, which is predicated on using a surrogate outcome. So not that the kids get better, because they actually didn't with this particular drug, but that the kids who are in the trial express this microdystrophin protein that I just showed you a picture of, okay? That surrogate model was, or that surrogate marker is what was used. The FDA, uh, and, uh, uh, back as early as uh, 2021, cautioned the sponsor that this was a poor surrogate marker, not demonstrating reasonable correlate to uh, even um, just sort of basic muscle function. And yet the company persisted, and uh, which should be taken as somewhat ironic for, uh, for us observers and us advocates, the, the company persisted because they said they had three previous drugs, which they haven't yet confirmed the efficacy of, three previous drugs that got through the same pathway using a similar truncated dystrophin as the predicate, as the pivotal marker for, uh, for these. So next slide, please. So let me just quickly in a couple of slides show you what we did um, in order to uh, resist this, because we reviewed the, you know, we decided we would take part in the advisory committee uh, that was convened for this. Um, and um, all this information, you know, public citizen is very transparent about this. So, the, so uh, my testimony is available on the, on the website. I'm showing you a link to it. But we did decide that it was an important enough issue that we should uh, enter into the fray and testify. We chose to uh, oppose this. Um, uh, this particular biologic. Next slide, please. And here are the, is a quick summary of why we chose to oppose SRP 9001, now brand Elevitis, okay? Um, the pivotal clinical trial, 41 subjects, 20 treated, already small. That seems to be the way that the FDA is going. Small trials can sometimes get through if they demonstrate uh, you know, substantial effectiveness, especially for a rare disease. Even that's struggling for us. But the point is, the primary endpoint was not met. These kids who received the drug did not do significantly better than those who didn't. As such, they went to an accelerated approval pathway. The surrogate endpoint I just described for you is expression of microdystrophin, which they did see in these kids. The problem is, and there were uh, at least two. One I've described already. We know for sure this microdystrophin is not the same as full dystrophin. So we know it's never going to be a complete remedy for this illness, number one. Number two, there was a weak correlation even between this biomarker and the functional scores. No surprise, that's probably why they didn't see a correlation with the actual overall function and a significant uh, effectiveness difference that would support this uh, remedy. Um, on top of that, and again, Dr. Zuckerman described this, there are four previous accelerated approvals that used truncated dystrophin molecules um, with uh, a, a different methodology. Instead of delivering uh, completely novel uh, fragments of, of, uh, of genes for expression, they actually use an exon skipping uh, uh, approach, which basically skipped over some of the error error regions of the, of the, of the um, uh, in vivo gene in, in certain patients. And these were approved on accelerated approval, especially at a person, you know, which the, the, uh, uh, the post-marketing surveillance study was due. They, the Sarepta has not submitted uh, uh, any data uh, uh, supporting uh, that previous accelerated approval, the same company three times previously 
uh, has received this kind of approval, and yet they haven't delivered uh, on a remedy despite having the ability to sell these drugs for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars each. Next slide, please. We also sent a follow-up letter after the advisory committee uh, meeting. Um, and, and I just wanna make some quick points about that and then we can open it up for some Q&A and some discussion. The advisory committee proceedings, and we make this point in the letter, this is directly now to the FDA, the committee had already, a uh, uh, committee meeting had already occurred on a very narrow vote, eight to six, they decided to green light uh, SRP 9001. That's in those, uh, 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 that's likely one of the reasons that the drug uh, got its accelerated approval. We decided uh, uh, just before that accelerated approval became official to send the FDA a letter that basically made four points. First of all, we were concerned the advisory committee proceedings were skewed with anecdote over evidence. I'm gonna make that point on my last slide in a moment. Um, some more on that in a second. Um, we also felt the FDA was too silent and too optimistic about the agency's withdrawal prop powers. When drugs get approved, even via accelerated approval, it is very difficult to get them off the market. It takes years. The agency does not have much uh, authority to do that. They don't often exercise their authority. Um, the genie gets out of the bottle. That point was not made well, we thought, to the advisory committee. That's one of the reasons that they got the eight of 14 books that, that, that they needed, we believe. And we wanted the, the FDA to know that we were concerned about that. The time course of the illness is also an issue. I'm gonna make a point about that on the next slide. And immunogenicity remains a problem. Just before this drug was approved, a young man in his 20s died because of a reaction to the, uh, to, to the AAV virus when they were trying to deliver a CRISPR-Cas9 based um, gene therapy to him for his uh, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So it's a real risk. Moreover, it, immunogenicity means you get one chance at a gene therapy like this. You can't get another gene therapy later because you will have built up T cell resistance to that uh, uh, adenovirus delivery vector. It makes it impossible for you, at least at the moment, to get it again, to get the same kind of therapy again. So, so it's, a, it's a lost opportunity for some. Next slide, please. Um, regarding the proceedings, I just want to point out there was a colloquy between an industry representative who said, you know, who, who sits on the panel and who asked about these videos of these kids walking uh, that were very dramatic and, and a big part of the testimony. In response, a uh, clinician who was involved in developing this drug and who was a paid consultant for the sponsor said the following, these videos are not outliers. They really represent profound benefit, profound durable effects. We just don't see it in muscular dystrophy. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about an, op an observation by somebody with clear financial conflicts of interest, okay? They may be a wonderful clinician and who's saying, hey, look, you gotta believe me. This is a miracle that really happened here. That kind of influence we thought was inappropriate and too skewed in these proceedings. Again, a reason why there was a, we think there was a narrow vote in favor of this, not because of good science, however. Next slide, please. The disease course is pictured here, the natural disease course. And what I just wanna point out to you is that if you look at the age range from six to eight years old, or from four to six years old, you see kids on their functional score tend to plateau. And if we take 40 observations out of there, we might well find some individuals who look like they're responding to a drug, or at least stabilizing in response to a drug when they may not be. They may just be, uh, it may just be a spurious uh, 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 result. Um, this was not, uh, this was not taken into enough consideration, we think. The FDA should have demanded the sponsor before releasing this drug on the market should have continued with more clinical trial uh, uh, and higher clinical trial numbers in order to demonstrate uh, if in fact there was a, a therapeutic effect. And this is my last slide. It was very, very emotive a testimony uh, during uh, the meeting uh, that uh, you know, came from some really bright patient advocates. The gentleman on the left uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Christopher B 
Buddy Cassidy, soon perhaps to be Dr. Cassidy as he's enrolled in a PhD program, uh, I think at USC in English literature. He was very articulate. He had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, and he was very articulate about the need. There's no, uh, there's no denying there's huge need for this. Um, similarly, and he did, a, he did a wonderful job, I think, for his community uh, uh, advocating for the need. But what he didn't do a good job of is uh, describing uh, what we believe should be more concerns about the way these drugs are being promoted, marketed, and fast-tracked approved before they are ready. Similarly, the right-hand panel shows you a video that was shows, showed during the open public testimony of an 11-year-old boy getting up from a line to listen to something that many individuals with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy simply can't do. I mean, it's brutal. It's heartbreaking. A little boy running down the hallway. Um, again, the company uh, was making the case that this is not an outlier, but we don't know right now if it's an outlier. We need more information. Um, that is the kind of scientific advocacy, right? And we're, we're, we're part of advocacy grand rounds here. So uh, public citizen um, and others, you know, have the challenge of, of engaging in these debates, of sometimes saying no. We don't mind saying no to pharmaceutical companies that are going to make gobs of money on a fast track approval, even if it eventually ends up being detrimental or placebo at best. Um, we do have a hard time, but we feel it's our responsibility and we call on uh, folks like you as well to um, you know, speak directly to patients about what we do and don't know about uh, uh, remedies, uh, as elegant as they might seem on paper to treat terrible diseases like Duchenne. So uh, I'll pause there and uh, happy to take questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you both so much for uh, your excellent presentations today. Um, we're going to move into our structured Q&A session now, um, and I'll invite our audience to contribute questions uh, using the chat or Q&A functions below. Um, I have a question that I can um, start us off with. Um, I think both of your presentations did an excellent job highlighting um, the, the challenges of balancing um, different uh, competing interests and needs in the development of drugs for rare diseases. Um, and I was struck by um, comments made by Dr. Peter Marks, who's the, for those who don't know, the director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at FDA. Um, so the division that uh, is ultimately tasked with approving um, drugs like, like Elvitas. And he had said that, um, you know, a, a failed clinical trial or a clinical trial that doesn't show benefit um, is not necessarily the end of the line. It may be an opportunity to review trial design or statistics performed or control groups used. Um, and I'm curious, um, both of your thoughts on a statement like that. Is that something that we've seen before in drug approvals? Um, is that the way that you think of clinical trials, especially for rare diseases? Um, and any other thoughts you might have? Well, well I'll just uh, jump in and say, that we actually put together a letter, and that was one of the examples we sent um, to the commissioner saying, you know, center directors should not be at these advisory committee meetings, basically telling people how to vote. And what I remembered about, um, because I also spoke at, uh, during public comment as uh, Dr. Abrams did, um, you know, what I remembered was him basically saying, um, you know, we need to be flexible. This is a terrible disease. I mean, that's how I heard it. And he, he was very clear. And some of the people who voted for approval on the advisory committee did say, well, FDA is not concerned. You know, if FDA isn't so concerned, you know, I, I was concerned about the data, but then I heard that FDA isn't so concerned. So there, uh, and Dr. Marks did uh, actually uh, as had happened with the first Duchenne's drug, he ignored his own scientists who were much strong, you know, who were strongly opposed and expressed that. And he decided that flexibility was more important. And yes, uh, just because a, a, a small study doesn't show improvement doesn't mean there is no improvement, but it sure doesn't mean there is improvement. Uh, yeah, so agreeing 
completely with the doctor's recommend. Uh, and and it is the it is clearly the FDA's responsibility to judge safety and effectiveness both. Uh, it's and, and absurd to suggest that you would unleash on the market a three point two million dollar therapy uh, with a trial of forty one individuals that gives you at best a borderline result. And that was only after they did post hoc. Um, you know, analysis and they cut the data. And that means it's even less than 40 subjects in terms of the, think about the power there. It is not persuasive. It's not a good look for Dr. Marks that he didn't go along with his uh, scientific advisors here uh, or for the FDA more generally. And, and now that this drug and likely soon others are approved, um, how, how would you have, um, I guess the, the medical community and, and also the FDA continue to evaluate these, these drugs moving forward. Uh, I, I was just going to say there is a trial. Interestingly enough, with this particular drug, there is a trial that's ongoing that, according to the sponsor, Sarepta is going to give a readout uh, at the end of this year. So as uh, the watchdogs that we are, we're going to be watching that closely and we're not going to let up on our criticism about you know the way that the FDA has behaved in this case. I mean, this isn't the first time that they've uh, made missteps uh, with regard to uh, you know this this kind of disease, right? A terrible disease that um, uh, ha you know is in desperate need, and yet the and the therapy is looks elegant, and yet it's premature uh, approval. So uh, this is a this is an example we're going to uh, not forget about and not stop looking at. Yeah, and, and I'll be interested to see, uh, you know, according to this change.org uh, petition, um, some Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance companies are paying. Um, it'll be interesting to see how many do, but, you know, it is hard. It's very, you know, no insurance company wants to be the bad guy. Um, and as you can see, they, they get accused of being the bad guy, even if they follow the FDA approval, which is only for four and five-year-olds. And and there, as, uh, as Dr. Abrams pointed out, there were only 40 kids in the study to begin with, half of them getting the drug. And I think half of them were six or seven years old. And those were the ones uh, that didn't do better. So you're really talking about 10 kids, 10 kids who actually got the drug, uh, got the, the biologic. So th this is nothing resembling evidence and it's a hugely expensive. And, you know, the company may have had an excuse, I don't necessarily buy it, but when they had one drug and no money coming in, that was a reason to say we have to get approval in order to continue to um, do research. But they now have four drugs and they're, spend, they're getting a lot of money, a lot of taxpayer money for those drugs. So what's their excuse for not collecting more data before they asked for approval? Absolutely, and it's it's heartening to hear that both of your organizations are continuing to work on this this issue and anticipate it moving forward as we see new gene therapies get developed. Um, I, I do want to be thoughtful of everybody's time in their afternoon. Um, I would just end by um, asking uh, both Dr. Zuckerman and Dr. Abrams, um, do you have any other final thoughts on this topic, or are there ways that um, the public, whether it's clinicians um, on this call or others, um, could be um, you know, get involved either with your organizations or the this process? Yeah, let me just say that um, we work with the Patient, Consumer, and Public Health Coalition, which does include Doctors for America, um, and also includes other uh, nonprofit organizations. So it's a coalition of nonprofits. And together, this coalition sent this letter that I mentioned. So that is one of the ways, if anybody um, listening uh, belongs to another organization in addition to Doctors for America, that's another way to get involved as well, as well as being a member of Doctors for America. So we work very closely with DFA and uh, that's an important thing that we do as, a, as part of a coalition. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I can echo that. We, we, also, uh, we also work a lot with Doctors for America as well. And, and as folks are interested, um, you know, we're, we're very much, uh, um, you know, uh, as our name implies, you know, public citizen, we're very much of, 
an advocacy organization driven by um, uh, you know thoughtful research base, both in the biomedical front and the legal front. Um, uh, uh, you know approaches, and uh, we welcome uh, you know input, uh, especially from folks who have uh, you know detailed. Uh, in this case, detailed clinical knowledge or detailed regulatory knowledge, and are concerned about uh, the many decisions that FDA is making on a on a regular basis, like this one. So, I'm so happy to have allies like both of you, and uh, you know we look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. Um, since we're just about out of time, um, I want to thank one more time Dr. Diana Zuckerman, Dr. Michael Abrams for taking the time to share their insights into this evolving landscape of gene therapies and drug regulation. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us. Um, I'll make one final request uh, or plea for you to join Doctors for America and to support our mission for affordable, accessible, and equitable health care in the United States. Um, any questions you have after this presentation, uh, feel free to reach out. Thanks again for attending Advocacy Grand Rounds for this month, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>